Ray, this new concept of neurophilosophy is a way of embedding everything we can think about, the mind or consciousness, as founded entirely on the nervous system, on the brain. You've coined a different term, neuromania. What does that mean? Well, neuromania is a broader concept, really. Neurophilosophy, if you like, is the original sin. And that is the notion of identifying the mind and the brain. But if we are our brains, and our minds are our brains, and the brain is an evolved organ, then we can be understood in terms of in Darwinian terms as uh, the products of evolution, and everything we do can be understood in biological terms. So it's a key step in biologizing us, if you like. And from this flow a whole variety of pseudo-disciplines, like neuroesthetics, which tries to explain our exp experience of art, indeed the reduction of art, in terms of neural activity and the uh, particular evolutionary functions that it serves. Neuroeconomics. Neuroeconomics, neurolaw, <laughs> neurotheology, you name it, there are plenty of neuroprefixed pseudosciences. But the Darwinian approach to understanding all of biology, including our minds and our brains, is commonly accepted. How, does, how do you deal with that? You said including our brains and our minds. I have absolutely no doubt that the brain is an evolved organ. What I do question is whether human minds are evolved organs in the same way. It seems to me that Darwin has given us a perfectly acceptable explanation of the origin of the organism Homo sapiens that isn't the same as an explanation of persons. In other words, he's given us a clear account of our biological roots, but that doesn't explain our cultural leaves. And it seems to me that when we're thinking about art, when we're thinking about theology, we're no longer thinking about an organism, an isolated organism, or indeed interacting organisms, we're thinking about a community of minds, which itself has developed over many hundreds of thousand years, long after we parted company uh, from the other primates. But this community of minds is just a product of all these community of brains, so it's all ultimately have to be represented by brain states. Call it whatever you like, call it social interaction, anything. It all ultimately has to be inputted into the brain expressed in neurological impulses and chemical changes between neurons in the synapses. It's all expressed in that way. Well, let me give an example. The appreciation of a particular work of art, let's say of Malevich or somebody like that, who's often chosen by the neuroesthetes as a very good example of how the brain explains our appreciation of art. Mm -hmm. You can't look at Malevich simply as a source of t brain tingles, as a stimulant. Basically, our appreciation of Malevich involves many things, including how he relates to previous people in the genre, what he was trying to say, what he was rebelling against. And then we look at the context in which we go to experience, have the experience of Malevich's art. We go to an art gallery explicitly to have an aesthetic experience. Then none of that can be explained in terms of the kind of behavior uh, that we see in other primates. Just remind me of a primate that queues for tickets in order to see, for example, a ballet. Well, but everything that we do in that experience is expressed through our brains. I mean, it, you see it in, in the neurological activity of the brain. When you're walking online to the art museum, when you're seeing it, you see the different fluctuations in, in different parts of your brain, and the more detailed you see it, the different you can express it. And I'm sure, probably can't do it today, but eventually you could. If somebody likes it or doesn't like it, you can see subtle differences in how their brain reacts. The brain, again, is a necessary condition. And let's think about walking. We can walk to the pub, we can walk to see a friend, we can go for a walk in the countryside. Both of, all of those things involve activity in our legs. But by looking in ever more minute detail at what's happening in our legs when we walk, we'll get no sense of exactly the purpose of the walks we take. You wouldn't pick up the difference between walking to see a friend and walking to an examination or uh, walking to for pure the sheer pleasure of walking. So to, is this an emergent quality that we're seeing that is resulting from just like you take hydrogen and, water, uh, and oxygen, put it together in, 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 a, in, a, in a ratio of two to one, and suddenly you have water with, with uh, properties of liquidity and uh, uh, all different kinds of phase transitions. Uh, you'd never be able to predict that from our knowledge today from just hydrogen and oxygen. That's, a, that's an, 
emergent, something that happens on a different level. Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about something so different as to require something totally outside of what we think is the physical world? I think emergent is a very tricky word. Those who appeal to emergence, what they really want to say is that nothing has changed. Basically, so that water has come out of H2O molecules, so there's nothing new in the phenomenal appearance of water. Of course there is, as human consciousness is seeing it. So if, if you're saying that human activity, human consciousness, the community of mind emerge mm -hmm. out of the biology, the biological givens, of course that's true, but it genuinely has emerged. It can't be seen, can't be understood by, as it were, reinserting it back into its material or biological origin. But everything you're saying, how we feel inside this community of minds, all has to be represented, has to be encoded into our brains, or it won't be effective at all. First of all, there are two loaded words in your description there. One is representation, and the other is encoding. And I think they're highly personifying terms. And it's interesting how we can make the brain seem like a person or do the job of a person by actually describing it in such a personified way. That's how we can brainify persons. We think of the brain representing, we think of the brain encoding things. These are things that very complicated human beings do between them. Well, so, computers can do that. Well, computers, not without our assistance. What happens in a computer in the absence of human consciousness is just basically electrical activity passing through wires. Are you denying that everything that, that we can use mentally has to be uh, um, a, a physical process in our brain. Well, that may be a necessary condition for mental activity, for our, ac for our accessing the uh, community of minds, but it isn't sufficient in itself. You won't find the community of minds by looking into the intracranial darkness. You can't stuff it all back. This public space that's been created between human brains over hundreds of thousands of years with totally new emergent phenomena such as rules, laws, art galleries, and so on. You can't find it by stuffing it back in the brain. But how do I understand those things if it's not by uh, the neural activity in my brain? Do I have some radio communication with some spirit world? I mean, how, how does it work? Well, I think, again, the brain is a necessary condition, but I don't, don't think it's sufficient. So what, what do we need to make it sufficient? Well, we need a body, we need an environment, we need a community of minds. So in other words, all of those things are necessary. But I don't think we have the slightest idea of how those things relate. And going back to a very simple example, we have no idea how, for example, the experience of looking at a red object corresponds or relates to neural activity in the visual cortex. So, in that, if that were to be true, what are the dangers of neuromania? I think behind it is biologism the notion that ultimately we're just beasts. And so if we want to understand human beings, we look to Darwin's theory of evolution. So we look to our nearest primate kin to find out the kind of creatures we are, what to expect of us, and so on. And many uh, philosophers have done that. I mean, one particular philosopher, John Gray, has described us as Homo rapiens. We're just a particularly vicious primate. And if you want to look at how vicious primates can be, or indeed how vicious animals can be, just look at the animal kingdom. And so he has no hope for us. He thinks we're doomed, and all our attempts to improve our individual and collective lot are driven by vanity and confusion. We will never improve our, our collective lot. Therefore? Therefore, he says we should do nothing. At the best, and we should what do you say? I think we have a responsibility to improve our collective lot. I think historically we have done. There's been some catastrophic lapses in our behavior, particularly in the 20th century, when probably more people killed other people per head of population than at any time in history. But the fact remains, if we don't aim for some kind of progress, we certainly won't make any progress at all. And I'm not thinking here of looking towards a utopia achieved in one bound. I'm talking about incremental improvements and endless critical reflection on our behavior and on our institutions.